really, when we're doing these problems, um, you'll see that this kind of information doesn't stop. For example, we talked about the unit circle. Special right triangles led to the unit circle, which led to sines, cosines, and tangents, which led to graphing. All of that comes back together. These things that we're looking at right here directly reflect what we're talking or directly relate to what we're talking about in class today, which is all, which is pretty much just this stuff down here. Okay. Here are the answers to the first two questions. Take a look at those. Hopefully you remembered in order to find the missing piece, Pythagorean theorem, x squared plus y squared equals r squared. You can't forget about this stuff. It comes back over and over and over again. Okay. Questions on either of those two? No questions there? All right. Four. Yeah. I don't know which one you're looking at. Uh-huh. It doesn't matter as long as you have a negative there. Okay. For these guys down here, we're simply looking for what angle has an undefined value for tangent. Tangent is y over x, and undefined means I'm dividing by zero. Now, every number that we have, if we know one number, we actually already know what the other number is. We just don't know whether it's going to be positive or negative. That's why I have two answers for each of this. I'm thinking about my quadrants. Where am I positive? Where am I negative? But you'll see, when they gave me cosine, I already knew the x, so that means the y is going to be either a positive or a negative root 2 over 2. Were we all okay on number uh, 3 and 4? I scooched that up pretty fast. Okay, I wanted you guys to see 9 and 10. For problems like number seven I and number six, I don't like thinking about it this way. And actually what you can do is you can kind of like backward step the rationalization. And this would have been negative two over the square root of three. And then you can use that to try to figure out what it is that we're talking about. So if that's cosecant. That then means that the sign is going to be negative root three over two. Same thing with this. I took the fraction that it gave me and I undid the rationalization. That way I could kind of think a little bit easier as to what was going on with that problem. This here is pretty much today's entire lesson. We're going to be looking at it in a slightly different angle, though. The main idea is can you work your unit circle backwards? If I give you the tangent, sine, cosine, secant, cosecant, can you find what the angle would be? Seriously, any questions out of all of these? No questions? Okay, we're not actually going to be taking a quiz today. We're not taking a quiz over the graphing because I got the classwork and it looks like most of you guys are, are doing pretty well with that. And I would rather focus a little bit more time on what we're doing with this. You will have a quiz over this at the end of next class. So just to make sure everybody knows like where we're going, what we're going through this. Today we're going to be doing what's called inverse trig. Uh, next class is going to be on Thursday. Thursday we're going to finish that up. Just basically spend, spend a lot of time practicing. At the end of the block we'll take a quiz over it. And then Monday of next week, because you actually have a full week of school next week. How are we going to do this? I don't know. Monday, we're going to be doing the review, and your test is going to be on Wednesday. Okay? Hey, guess what? You're not going to have a test right before Thanksgiving in this class. Nope, because we have um, school on Monday. Today's Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you guys actually have one class at least where you're not going to be taking a test right before Thanksgiving. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, one thing that I did realize, I try to take into account like how people are doing these, doing on these lessons. And frankly, I think I kind of butchered this lesson yesterday. I am a little obsessed when it comes to math with understanding the whys. Like, why does this work out? How do these things all fit together? And there are just some times that I need to realize that y'all don't need to know the whys. So I put way too much effort last class into doing the whys. So today we're going to just focus on the hows for this. So I've got, you're going to be kind of flipping back and forth between the notes that are in your packet and this, taking a slightly different approach because I think it might make things a little bit more clear to you. And if you still want to know the why, I would be so excited and happy to show you why these things work out the way that they do. But if I did that, I'd probably lose 75% of the class. So I'm trying not to lose you today. It's amazing. I already lost you. Dang it. So what we'll do is we will pause here. When we come back from lunch, we will pick up with this. But we are going to be, don't put your notes away because we are going to be flipping back and forth between that. You might want to have your unit circle out if you're not good at that. Okay? All right, so last chance for questions on the warm-up. Any questions with that? All right, like I said, we are going to be going back and forth between the notes that you've got in front of you and notes that I'm going to be giving you once I figure out where I put them. Oh, no, where did I put them? I already did. I already, I already gave them to you. Okay, I already gave them to you. That would be where they went. All right, so what we had been doing is focusing a lot on graphing our trig functions. Graphing trig functions is very important because of all the applications it fits into, visualize the changes that are going on, see how these waves are represented. And if you go into higher math classes, you'll see that this is all over the place. Another good thing about graphing is it kind of helps you understand this idea that we're talking about today, which are inverse trig functions, okay? Inverse trig functions. Well, first off, we need to understand what the word inverse means. How do I find an inverse? What's that mean? Seeing a lot of this. It's not necessarily reciprocal. Reciprocal is the inverse of multiplication. Overall, how do we find an inverse? Like when we were talking about logs and exponents, they were inverses of each other. How did we do that? How did I graph a log? Not flip the fractions. Remember, switch the x and y. Wasn't one over. How I went to graph an exponent, I said, OK, if I've got an exponent, I can switch the x and y and graph that. That gives me a log. That's what we're doing. Now, in order for a function to have an inverse, it has to be what's called a one-to-one -one function. A one-to-one -one function means every x has only one y, and every y has only one x. So you can think about that in terms of passing the vertical line test to see if it is a function. And then the horizontal line test is what we're adding to that to show that the inverse is also a function. That makes it one to one. In order for our sines and cosines to have inverses, to be that one to one, to pass both vertical and horizontal line tests, we have to narrow our focus. For the sine, we change our focus to this window here, from negative pi over two to pi over two. If I were to graph a sine like on a regular grid, kind of like that, this would have been my axis. Does sine start top, middle, or bottom? Middle. And then sine typically goes which direction? Okay, going to the right, it goes up. And my next, since we've got a regular old period of 2 pi, that means each section is pi over 2. If I were to back up over here, what's it going to do? It's going to go down. The portion of the sine graph that we're looking at is the portion that goes from here to there. 
what that gives me is that gives me X values, things that I can put in that give me both positive and negative Y values. If I were to have continued graphing this, notice how these guys stop with, peer, with points. I do not have arrows on them. You guys see that? That's very important. If I were to have kept going with this, it would have gone down. This side would have gone up. If you look at that, I still pass the vertical line test. But if I go and I try to talk about the horizontal line test, do you see how here I am hitting in more than one spot? And actually, your sine waves are going to keep hitting and hitting and hitting over and over again because they just keep repeating that wave-like motion. So we cut this down to this window right here specifically so that I can pass the horizontal line test and the vertical line test. With this graph, just what I have here in, in this purple, that's purple by the way, looks like blue sometimes, what is the domain of this? What do I have graphed? Negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2. What is the range for this graph? One more time. Negative 1, 2, positive 1. And we hit in each of those cases. I go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 and negative 1 to positive 1. I just told you, what do you do to find an inverse? Swap the x and y. So that's what we're going to do. We are going to switch the x and y. And I'm going to do that starting with the points. What does 0, 0 become? 0, 0. That was hard. What does pi over 2, 1 become? 1 pi over 2. Negative pi over 2, negative 1 becomes negative 1, negative pi over 2. So not only are we switching x and y, but what you need to remember is you will also need to flip your curves. I don't know what I was going to write there. Flip the curve. That means this guy kind of curves this way. You can curve the other way on this because it's a reflection. And this guy is going to curve like that. What we're doing is when we flip our x and y, we're reflecting it over the line y equals x. So anything that curves above is now going to be curving below. I switched my x and y. What do you think that's going to do to my domain and range? Switch them. So what's my domain here? Negative 1 to 1. Switching the domain and range. What is my range going to be? Negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now the way that we write this, what we were doing here is we were saying sine of x equals y. To flip your x and y, to rewrite that now becomes arc sine of y equals x. That's how we write those inverses. Sometimes you will see that written sine to the negative one. But the problem with that, people see a power of a negative one. And a lot of times they think, oh, that just means one over sine. But one over sine is cosecant. It's not arc sine. But either of these guys mean the same thing. If you see arc sine or the inverse sine means instead of having the angle in here and the cord matching coordinate point out here, we have the coordinate point in here and the angle on the outside. Cosine works pretty much the exact same way. If I start off with cosine x equals y, what is the whole idea behind 
inverses. Flip them. Flip what? Flip X and Y. That makes it so I can say the arc cosine of Y is equal to X, or if you'd rather write the inverse cosine, to go like that. Those are all equivalent statements. This window looks a little bit different than our sine window does. There's a really good reason for that. And I can go into that. I'd be more than happy to, but I'm going to confuse you. So you're just going to go with it. You're going to tell me I'm going to graph cosine on this graph. Will cosine start top, middle, or bottom? Top. The next point is the middle. The next point would be bottom. Looking at it within this window, you can see that I get positive values for y and I get negative values for y. Okay, the short and sweet reason as to why we're doing it on that window is if I were to continue my graph here or continue my graph here like I have in the sine problem, how that's over here, do you see if I moved it over and I included that part right there, I would now have something that's not an inverse, like I couldn't do an inverse of that? It fails the horizontal line test. If I were to continue out my cosine this direction, it would fail the horizontal line test. So we include only the pieces that pass both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. Okay, so that graph, what is your domain for that graph? Zero to pi. Go all the way left to zero, all the right, right to pi, and you include both of those values. What is the range for this one? Negative 1, 2, 1. And we include those values. When we talk about the inverse or the arc cosine, gee, what do you think you're going to do? Flip X and Y. You think it's important for me that you understand that the inverses simply switch your X and Ys? Think it might be important. So flipping the X and Y. 0, 1 becomes 1, 0. Pi over 2, 0 becomes 0 pi over 2. And pi negative 1 becomes negative 1 pi. Not only do you switch your x and y's, you've got to remember to also flip the curve. That means for this portion here, rather than going down like that, nope, that's wrong. If I were to do a reflection, you can kind of think about it visually. If I were to reflect over this line, you see how that curve would basically come back on itself? Do you see what I'm talking about if I were to fold that over? If I fold that over, it would basically be the same thing. And then this guy would go all the way over here, curving up. Flip the curve. on. Okay. Let's try tangents. I'm sorry, we didn't do domain and range. Oof! What's the domain going to be? Negative, negative one to one What's your range going to be? Zero to pi. Okay? 
There's one more that we're going to talk about. That's the tangent. If I were to graph a tangent, does the tangent on that axis, does it start with a point or an asymptote? A point. The tangent started with a point. And the asymptote was at the it was in the middle point like that. Did tangent go up on the right or down on the right? Up on the right. So that means at pi over 2, pi over 4, I would be here. This guy, I would be here. And that's the graph of the tangent. What would be the domain of what I have graphed right now? Negative pi over 2 through pi over 2. But it's not catching them, so we put what? Parentheses. That thingy. What about the range? How low does it go? How high does it go? Goes negative infinity to positive infinity. And I never reach those guys. Which without even graphing this, can you tell me what the domain of the arc tangent is going to be? Negative infinity to positive infinity. What's the range going to be? Beautiful. Everything flip-flops. If I had an asymptote at x equals negative pi over 2, where's the asymptote going to be over here? Yep, top and bottom. If this is x equals, my asymptote is now going to be on the y equals. So it's going to be going this way. Here we go. What is the inverse of 0, 0? 0, 0. This guy over here, that's pi over 4, 1. Where does that go to? 1, pi over 4. And the other guy goes negative 1, negative pi over 4. There's the graph for the arc tangent. Okay. Now, just to make sure you guys understand, hint, 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 and will not be surprised, hint, 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 if you see it again, hint, what I want you guys to do, I know this graph paper is really small on yours, I want you to, for this first graph, this is in your actual note packet stuff, on this grid, I want you to draw the arc sign. For the first one, you can copy it straight over. What you can see here is not only do I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 labeled, I also have the pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, 2 pi labeled. Okay? That way, depending upon which points you need, they're all clearly marked. So I want you to do the arc sign here, or inverse sign. And over on the next one, I want you to do arc cosine or inverse cosine. Just graph it. We're not changing anything. I just want you to graph it. Dude, did I not hit pause? Dang it, Augsburger. <sighs> Heavy sigh. Ah, well. What I need to be able to see from this, extreme goes up. 
I need to be able to see that for this graph, you went to 1 pi over 2, you went to negative 1, negative pi over 2. Ian? Probably not exactly this small. Okay? That's my arc sine. Okay? Note the way it curves. Note that I have dots at the end of this, not arrows. Note that it goes from negative 1 to positive 1, from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Whereas my arc cosine goes from negative 1 to positive 1, and it goes from 0 to pi. The reason why you have all of these different numbers on here, pi is what? It's a decimal. 3.14, so it kind of makes sense that it's right there. Divided by 2, that's a little bit more than 1.5, right about there. Okay, so it's just giving you the value so you don't have to guesstimate yourself. <sighs> all right, are you clear on that? Okay, let's use this idea to solve some problems. Okay? Don't worry about the tangent part. What we're going to do now is we are going to actually use these guys and find out what the heck they mean. I want you to put one thing, your, your paper is kind of weird on this side. Is it, it's like horizontal instead of vertical, right? So it means you've got a lot of room kind of up on top. You, are we on the same page? I would like you to draw something for me. I'm going to draw generally what my unit circle is like. So I have my axes. I have 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2. But I also know that some of my domains that I had went from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. That means when I was looking at this, I could have answers in those two quadrants for some of them, or some of the other ones went from here to here. Tell me what went from 0 to pi. What had its domain from 0 to pi? Cosine. This guy is going to be cosine, and it's also going to be the reciprocal of cosine, which is, nope, reciprocal is secant. Which function went from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Which one? Sine. For some reason I thought I heard pi. So we'll see sine and its reciprocal, which is cosecant. There was one other guy that actually went that route also. Who also went from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2? Tangent. And because we've seen through graphing just the regular tangent, you should know that secant is pretty much the exact opposite of the tangent. That means uh, the, I'm sorry, the cotangent. Cotangent goes up there with the cosine. Okay? For both of these, for the sine, cosecant, and tangent, if my value is positive, you're going to be in quadrant 1. Same thing with the other guy. If the value is positive, you are the quadrant 1 angle. Things get a little funky when we're talking about the negatives. 
for the cosine secant and cotangent, they're pretty, it's pretty straightforward. If it's negative, you are simply going to take the quadrant two version of that angle. But if it's sine, cosecant, or tangent, and you have a negative value, you are going to take your quadrant one angle and stick a negative in front of it. That's because sine, cos, uh, cosecant, and tangent have to go between negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. 11 pi over 6, not in that range. Pi over 6, negative, is in that range. 3 pi over 4, not in that range. Negative pi over 4 is in that range. And then when we're talking about cosine, secant, and cotangent, that's this guy. It's nice because this is going to be my negative quadrant. All right. I've given you all of the pieces to this puzzle. Now we're going to figure out how the heck do we put it back together again. Basically, if I show you the warm-up, I can tell you exactly what we do. So you're going to have a look at the warm-up. When I look at the warm-up, I'm just going to say, tangent has to be between what? Negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Do you see how neither of these guys really, this is equal to pi over 2? This one doesn't have an answer. Cosine has to be between what? 0 and pi. Which one of those works? 3 pi over 4. That would be your only answer. Sine has to be where? Between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Which one of those works? Cosecant has to be between what? Cosecant pairs up with sine, and sine had to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Do either of these work? None of those are in that range, but can I rewrite this one to be in that range? What is another way of, of thinking 5 pi over 3? What is a full circle? 2 pi. 2 pi in terms of thirds. If I wanted to change 2 pi to have a denominator of 3, what would that be? 6 pi over 3. What is 5 pi over 3 minus 6 pi over 3? Negative pi over 3. That would be your answer. Okay? Let's actually do some of these. You can think about this in many different ways. You can do it the actual way, which is just work it out, or you can do it kind of what we were doing with the warm-up. This is like saying the sine of some angle is 1. What coordinate has a sine of 1? Or even... If the sine is 1, that tells me which coordinate. Sine is y. What is the only thing that pairs up with 1? 0. And no matter what, you're going to take the sign that they give you for that, so it's a positive 1. The other number you pair with it is always going to be positive. Always. And what angle goes to 0, 1? Pi over 2. Yup. Number two, another way to think about this is to say, who is the angle that has a sine of one half? And if you want to do it the coordinate way, sine is which coordinate? Y. What always pairs up with one half? 
root 3 over 2, and no matter what, the one you always fill in is always positive. What angle's there? Pi over 6. And ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have your unit circle memorized yet, you can memorize your unit circle with one little fact. And it's pretty simple. Just memorize the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. Yes. The only negative you will ever have is, for example, here they give you a negative. The other one that you fill in will always be positive. Yeah, either one is negative and the other is positive, or they're both positive. Those are your only options. Okay? Let's try this one. What angle has a sine of root 3 over 2? If the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, which one is root 3 over 2? Pi over 3. Do you see how I did that? Basically, they flip-flop. If the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, that means the sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. They fill out that coordinate. Okay, let's try some coordinates for cosine. Cosine is which coordinate? X. So X is 0. What is the only number that pairs up with 0? 1. What angle is there? Pi over 2. What is the only angle that has a root 2 over 2 in it? Boom. And you see how it's positive? I don't need to do anything with it. I just want the, the first quadrant angle that has that. Which angle has a sine, I'm sorry, a cosine of 1 half? Well, we'll, we'll get to the 2 pi. Right now I want to know, is it over 3, 4, or 6? 3, so it's going to be over 3. You see how that's negative? For cosine, what quadrant do I do? Quadrant 2. X is not a quadrant. 2. So that means this is going to be in quadrant 2. That's 2 pi over 3. Tangent. What is tangent? One more time. Tangent is y over x. So all of these are y over x. When is the only time I'm going to have a tangent of 1? Pi over 4. Because in order to get 1, it has to be the same for both, right? That means this is going to be pi over 4. It's positive. That means it's in the first quadrant. Done. I don't like this because I think in terms of y and x, but I don't have any x's that are threes. Do you understand what I'm talking about there? My whole unit circle, I don't have an x equal three anywhere. So I'm going to rewrite that. How can I rewrite that? One over root three. And if I've got one over root three, tangent is what over what? y over x, so that's 1 and root 3. They're both going to be over 2s. My goodness, what are they doing? What angle is that? Because that's my unit circle. Okay, so one more time, that's pi over 6. Tangent is what over what? Y over X, so I need a 1 here. That means Y is root 3, X is 1. I'm not even thinking about the negative right now. Is that a pi over 6 or a pi over 3? That's a pi over 3. Where is tangent negative? What do I do if I have a negative tangent? Tangent. 
What did I tell you to write down? If your tangent is negative, what do you do? Stick a negative in front of your quartile one angle. Just like that. This takes a lot of practice because you've got to go back and pull all of those unit circle angles back into your brain and you're playing with them in a, kind of a different direction. All right, so you might want to recap this. I believe you've got a spot for this on your paper. You want to make sure that you know that the functions that go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 that is your sine, cosecant, and tangent. For 0 to pi, that's cosine, secant, and cotangent. I want you guys to do 10 through 13 for me, please. 10 through 13. Hopefully you guys were able to get those four. Do you check your answers with your neighbors? All right, let's, let's see. See if we're in the same spot. This is going to, it's just going to need a lot of practice. I'd be happy to do number 10. On number 10, they give me the sine. Sine is which coordinate? The y. So it means I know the y is negative 1. The only choice I have for the x is 0. Problem with the sine. When sine is negative, where did I put that? When sine is negative, you're going to say, what is your quadrant 1 angle? and shoot negative in front of it. And the reason for that is I would normally be thinking about this in terms of 3 pi over 2, right? But 3 pi over 2 is not in the range that I need from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So I could also subtract 4 pi over 2, because that's a full circle, and that also gives me negative pi over 2. Okay, we just have to make sure that our answers always fall within those ranges. All right. The way these get just a touch harder is just by layering different concepts together. So what you see here, these are compositions. There's a function in a function, it's like crazy substitution. But these guys aren't that bad. All you're going to do is you're going to work from the inside out. So if I think about this, the cosine, negative one half. Cosine is which coordinate? X. No matter what, the other coordinate is going to be root 3 over 2, and it's positive. And you know what, guys? I don't even care what angle is there. Do you understand why I don't care what angle is there? That's because I'm asking for the sign of whatever that angle is. So we would just say root 3 over 2. I don't even have, and to me, that angle part is the hardest part. You could have done it this way. You would have said the sign the this coordinate here matches with a cosine that's going to be in the second quadrant that's going to be pi over three so that would have been two pi over three and then the sine of two pi over three is the y coordinate of that point which is root three over two yes. No, and the reason why is when we have an inverse cosine, your answer is an angle, 
And if I have regular, the answer is the coordinate. So if I did inverse cosine and then inverse something again, I can't work that way. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Sine is which coordinate? Sine is the y. That means what does x have to be? And you can either think what angle is here. What angle is there? Pi over 3. And then take the cosine of that. But the cosine of that is just the x-coordinate. I want you to skip 17, but I want you guys to do 16, 18, and 19 for me, please. Skip 17. Here we go. Okay, Kendra, you're right. She goes, nope. Might as well be Monday. All right, do you guys have questions on those three? Yes. Tangent is correct. That should have been, yes. So this should have been tangent is y over x. That means that should have been pi over 3, which means the secant would have been 2. Is that better? Okay. Thank you for correcting that. Anybody else? Okay. Now, a lot of you guys are going to be tempted to just say, ooh, cosine and inverse cosine cancel each other out. The truth is, is that they do some of the times. Because the cosine of pi over 3, well, pi over 3 is what coordinate? 1 half root 3 over 2. And if I find the inverse cosine of that, I would say, okay, what angle has a cosine of 1 half? And your answer would have been pi over 3. You okay with that? That just feels nice. But it doesn't, uh, it would have been, this answer here is pi over 3. But it is not always that nice. So go back to the second set of paper that I gave you today on the back. Remember, what we're talking about here, whenever we have something nestled inside something else, that is a composition of functions. What this up here says, if I have a function and it's inverse, and those are the way that we write them, and x is in the domain of both, then what we can do is we can say f of f inverse of x equals x, and the inverse of f of x is also x. Basically, what we're saying is these two will simplify away, will cancel each other out, and you will be left with just what is in the middle here. But that only happens, ladies and gentlemen, that only happens if x is in the domain of both functions. If it's not in the domain of both functions, you cannot just cross it out. So we have to think about what those domains, where are these guys allowed to be? When we're thinking about this, sine and inverse sine. 
when the inverse sign is on the inside here. X has to be between negative 1 and 1. If the regular sign is on the inside, then the number inside has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. If you have sine, cosine, tangent, or any of the other ones on the outside, that means I could have sine of the inverse cosine of, I don't know, let's say root 3 over 2. If I had that, if the sine, cosine, or tangent on the, is on the outside, your answer will be a coordinate. Like root 3 over 2, 1 half, 0, negative root 2 over 2. If this is on the outside, your answer, your final answer is going to be a coordinate. If, however, you had inverse sine, inverse cosine, or like arc tangent, any of those on the outside, that would be like arc tan of sine of pi over 4. For those, your answer is an angle. Okay, to kind of keep track of what you're looking for your answer to kind of be in the form of. Looking at it this direction, sine is on the outside. Is my answer going to be a coordinate or an angle? A coordinate. You so far so good? If the sine is on the outside, that number that's in here has to be between negative 1 and 1. Is that between negative 1 and 1? Yes. That means for my answer, it is just negative one-third. That's it. Cosines work similarly. Cosine, if you've got the inverse on the inside, it has to be between zero and one. I'm sorry, negative one and positive one. But my inverse cosine has to do what? between 0 and pi. Your final answer for tangent can be anything. The final answer for inverse tangent must be between pi over 2 and pi over 2. But look, did I put my or equal to signs there? No, I have no or equal to signs there. So make sure you do that. Let's put this all together now. Okay, these guys match up, right? What number's on the outside? Is it going to, I'm sorry, is my answer going to be an angle or a coordinate? Okay, when I'm looking for cosine, it's going to be a coordinate. If I'm looking for cos cosine, this number here has to be between negative 1 and 1. Is that? Yeah. So what's my answer going to be? Two-fifths.
for this dude. Arc cosine is on the outside. Is my answer going to be an angle or a coordinate? Angle. And for my angles, I have to be, when the cosine is on, when it's set up like this, that number on the inside, when it's cosine, has to be between 0 and pi. Is that between 0 and pi? What is 3 over 2? 1 half. What's pi? 3.14? Is this between? Yeah, so what's the answer? Just 3 halves. Cancel each other out. It's just that normally when we're talking about radians, we have pi's in there. That's a thing. Okay, yay, matching. Tangents on the outside, do I want an angle or a coordinate? Coordinate. So tangent on the outside, I can be anything. What's my answer here going to be? Negative 9 over 2. Okay. Is this one okay? Because if I were to look at this, this is, when we're talking about here, this is a tangent on the outside, right? Then this guy on the inside has to be between negative infinity and infinity. Because it's in between negative infinity and infinity, it's just itself. Okay? Number five is one fourth in the range I can use. So, what's my answer? Number six is this number in the range I can use. When sine is on the outside, that inside number has to be between negative 1 and 1. Is that between those two values? That means our answer does not exist. Okay, I want you guys to do 7 through 10, please. You guys are all so wide awake today, she said sarcastically. Another zombie class. Take a look at those. Questions on these, ones that we've done so far. Now, if we have a problem like these, you can do this a couple of different ways. This says if the angle is outside the domain, rewrite it using an angle with an equivalent trig value that is in the domain. That's been causing a lot of people trouble. The easier way to do this is to say, for 3 pi over 4, what is the sign of, what is it, well, what's the general coordinate for 3 pi over 4? And then be a positive root 2 over 2. So what is the sine of 3 pi over 4? Root 2 over 2. It's this guy. So now I'm going to find the arc sine of root 2 over 2. What angle has a sine of root 2 over 2? In my domain. Pi over 4. Do you see what happened there? Basically, because we've got the arc sign on the outside, when the inverse is on the outside, then the number that's inside here, in order to get the nice rules, has to be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. 3 pi over 4 is not in that window. So because it's not in the window, we've got to kind of think of the whole problem again. 
You say, okay, for 3 pi over 4, the sine is root 2 over 2. Then using that, find the angle within the restrictions that we have. So sine is going to be in quadrants 1 or a negative quadrant 1 that has that sign, so it's pi over 4. Now when we're talking about the tangent of pi, um, when the point is pi, when the angle is pi, what's the point? Negative 1, 0. So what would the tangent there be? Right, because tangent, well, no, it's not undefined. Tangent is y over x, 0. So we're looking for the angle whose tangent is 0. In my window for tangent, tangent has to be between what? Negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Zero. So the only point that has a tangent of zero means that my y is zero, the x is something else. So that is at zero in radians. Okay, I want you guys to try 13 and 14 for me, please. Compare with your neighbors when you think you've got it. This is tricky because you've got to really know your unit circle inside and out to do this stuff. 